Welcome to today's episode of Financial Fluency. Today, I have Michelle Bobro with me from the Holistic Wallet. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jen. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. <laughs> I was curious what you're going to say because just before we hit record, Michelle <laughs> told me that she had emergency dental surgery today. So thank you for showing up anyway. I probably wouldn't have. I probably would have canceled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm like, I'm soldiering through it. it it'll be over, you know, and before I know it. And Okay. Are you on pain medicine? No, I'm not. So that's brave. I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with this stuff. So. Okay. Well, I love the name of your company, the holistic wallet, because I do feel like finances are never just money. There's so much emotion and intention and expectation and desire and fantasy yeah. <laughs> wrapped up in this thing we call personal finance. So yeah. can you tell me how you came to have this business? What so, brought so, <laughs> I, um, I started, I graduated from college in the Great Recession. And I had about fifty thousand dollars of consumer debt. So I had um, most. It was like thirty thousand uh, student loans, another twelve or so of a car loan, and then the rest was credit card debt. I was just like spending during college, and um, and I was able to land a job. I, I wound up going to um, graduate school. I started graduate school just to like defer my student loans. Like I really didn't know what I wanted to do. It was just a matter of like the job market sucks. I like, I don't know what I'm doing. So um, I was able to actually land a job, a full-time job in uh, a corporate bank. And I was making decent money considering like I had nothing, my background's in women's studies and sociology. Like I know nothing about finance. And, but I was like, oh, I had this great opportunity. Like, let me earn the money in this job and just, you know, do the nine to five. And then I can do the stuff I'm passionate about outside of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, because I was making good money, I wanted to um, optimize the way that I was using where, you know, what my money was going towards. Like I wanted to pay down the debt. I didn't want to feel the way that I felt that like I was just doing things because of financial constraints and, and that I had to kind of frame my life around the bills I had to pay. And that kind of, that whole, all that research kind of like went down this rabbit hole of like finding the best strategies for personal finance and paying down debt and saving and tracking your spending and spending with your heart and intention and, and all these like ideas and ideologies and stuff. Um, and I loved it and I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I became so good at it that like, I had friends and family start asking me for help and um, cause I kind of talked about it all the time. And uh, then it, it kind of spiraled into a business and now I'm doing this full time. And I don't know, like five years ago, I would have never pictured that this is where I'd be right now, but here I am. Well, it's interesting you having the background in women's study. Cause I feel like for women in particular, we tend to carry a lot of, baggage and shame, as well as have a lot of conflicting cultural messages aimed at us about money and what, what women do with money, what women should do with money, women being gold diggers or spenders or, you know, we have all these things. Um, how yeah. do you think your women's studies background has influenced your approach to finances? Has well, it? Think, yes. And I think reading a lot, because I started like when you first like Google personal finance, a lot of the material is, has a very masculine um, approach where it's like all logic and just, you know, willpower and just, you know, work and, and it, it, there's no emotional component to it. There's no, like, th th there's, there is in, in the, I think the more feminine sector of personal finance, but um, in the mainstream one, which is, you know, obviously a masculine field, um, it's just, just don't take out, just don't have debt. Just don't spend your money on that stuff. Just, just don't do it. And, and that's, that you're completely, it completely ignores the human factor, like the emotional factor of like, we don't just spend money because our brains are like filled with air and we just don't know what we're doing. We just are, are oblivious to, you know, how finance works, you know, it's that we are 
we're relating to like media messages and, and things that we're supposed to buy because um, it, that's supposed to make us feel good. And I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're stressed and like, Oh, this is, this is who I'm supposed to be. This is this having this thing or living this lifestyle is what's going to make me a better person or a better woman. And, and that's a whole other, you know, it's, it's a big, t it's a big question you asked, it, it, but yes, it, I think that I was, I resisted a lot of the material that I started reading because it just didn't resonate with me and having a background in, in gender studies and, and, and I was able to, you know, look deeper into that. And rather than just being turned off by it, I found a way to kind of feminize the material in a way that resonated with me personally. And I don't think that's just with women. I think it's with everyone. There's, mm -hmm. or I think, you know, there's the feminine side of all of us, whether, you know, regardless of our sex. And um, I think men suffer from the, you know, the same issues with, um, you know, disregarding that emotional right brain creative side of personal finance. Mm -hmm. That's true. I always say it's kind of like dieting though. You know, if, if all we needed was a five-step plan, and we followed it and no one would be overweight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if all we needed was a logical plan, no one would be in debt. We, yeah. need, we need more than that. That's so true. So what do you think about um, women in the finance space who've come up lately, like, I mean, like Amanda Steinberg with Daily Worth and Sally Kerchek. Am I saying her name? I'm not sure I'm saying her name quite right. I just read yeah. Own It. She, the woman who started Elevest. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so these new sort of female focused investing companies, they both wrote books this year. Um, you know, we've always had Suze Orman, but honestly, I find Suze a bit masculine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she was always one of the guys, like she was yeah. the woman in the room with all the guys. And yeah, yeah. Because I'll be honest, Dave Ramsey did not re resonate with no. me. I, and I think <laughs> it's very, it's almost like a holier than now type of thing that I felt chastised. I yeah. Talked down to. Yeah. yeah. And, even um, like David Bach, you know, Automatic Millionaire, like I love the idea of Automatic Millionaire. I think that there's a lot of good stuff in automating things and taking the daily emotional decision out of as much as possible. Yeah. But did you read Rich Women? Uh, no. Was it Rich Women Finish First or? No. Uh, what? Smart, smart women finish rich. Smart women oh. finish rich. Okay. I found that equally... Um, condescending yeah and even the idea of the latte factor his whole big you know the latte factor i feel like that's very focused on women myself yeah. Like, yeah. don't buy flowers don't buy lattes because let's yeah. be honest a lot of men drink black coffee the yeah. latte the fancy coffee the fancy yeah. muffin the things that make you feel good and that you sit down with your friends and socialize over yeah like, those are the things that a lot of these man masculine books tell us to give up but yeah. for some of us those are um I'm sorry, I'm having a, a dog invasion. How did oh. you open the closed door? <laughs> like a BBC moment. Yeah, she, she can do it. It's <laughs> yeah. the door was shut. I don't know how That's she awesome. it. But, but yeah, I feel like um, the things that he wants us to cut out are things that tend, you know, might be that one thing that makes your workday bearable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like having coffee with your friends after work or a drink or something like that. Um, yeah how, how do you feel about that sort of standard advice that seems aimed at women um well I, it, it's obviously irritating um and I don't and I think like that's my politically I believe that like if we all are better at managing our finances it's going to be better for the the whole economy so when they when these uh messages like talk down to women and and kind of and like like what we're like we're doing something wrong where it's like granted like there there are some I, I can see both sides of it like one on one side like if you added up how much you spend on coffee a month that like like wow like that's you know that's money that could go towards paying down debt or, or something mm -hmm. but like having cutting out your coffee altogether like is then what's your quality of life? And, and I think that that's kind of like where the, you, we can fly back and forth on both sides of the spectrum where it's like super frugal, like doing nothing and then, you know, spendaholic and just living, you know, the, the YOLO mindset. And, um, but I think like, you know, there's, 
I think that there, there are still plenty of men out there that, um, that get the, the eat out for lunch that don't, you know, brown bag their lunch to work or, um, Mm -hmm. or, you know, they have their, maybe they have more like their haircuts or plus the, the whole, in our economy, like their haircuts are cheaper, their their clothing is cheaper. Like just their 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 upkeep in their you know physical bodies is is cheaper. Yeah, like it's just the razors. Like the 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 razor is it's the exact same razor. One's pink, one's blue, and there's a price difference. Like I just so so there's so the system's kind of rigged against us in in in, in a certain way. Um, but it's not like men don't spend money. It's just the stuff that they spend money on isn't considered um, not a necessity. And, and it's kind of like, oh, it's part of, you know, or like you, know, you go out to lunch, like, well, you're doing the networking lunch or you're, you know, you're, it's, it has, it serves a purpose. Whereas like when women do it, it's, oh, you guys are just, you know. Ladies who lunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and as you were saying that, I couldn't help thinking of things like tampons or birth control or, you know, I mean, we have yeah. these other added expenses and we get paid less as well. And I mean, we'll see what happens with, actually, I didn't even check on what happened with the vote on healthcare because we yeah. had friends visiting, but you know, <laughs> things like birth care, birth control, having no, um, not no deductible. What's the word I'm looking for? You know, when you go yeah, to this like the, upfront payment. <laughs> yeah, the, the the copay. Copay. That's the yeah. word I was looking for. Yeah, I mean, there are there are ways where it does feel like, um, yeah, we weren't considered. I mean, even just the corporate structure that started the idea of like going from your farm, going to a business, working for a boss who's supposed to take care of you your whole life, and then pay you a pension at the end of your life. Yeah. I mean, women weren't in that system when it was started until yeah. after World War II, really. So there, there are just so many ways we weren't really considered. So throwing us in right next to men and being like, why aren't you saving? Why, why don't you have retirement savings? <laughs> when a lot of jobs that we get don't have the 401ks or the pensions, I mean, hardly anyone gets those things anyway anymore, yeah. but, um, even just the social security, you don't have the, you, you didn't have you, if you were a stay at home parent, you didn't have the social security savings either. So yeah. What do you do now? Like, then are you just on, on Medicaid? Like I, I or, you know, you're just on welfare. Yeah. Like, how do you, what do you do for, for that, that whole, and that's a whole sector of our population right now. That's, I loved this uh, this bit that I read in a Gloria Steinem book a while ago that talked about the two stay-at-home moms who lived across the street from each other who should each go and clean each other's house and get paid for it because then they would be in the system, they would get Social Security, you know, they'd be in the exact same work, but in someone else's home, it would yeah. be a job and it would be appreciated and it would be funded, whereas yeah. when you do it in your own home, it's not. And I think I have special needs kids, so that's why I ended up leaving the traditional workforce was because I didn't have enough flexibility. Yeah. The same is true for people caring for elderly parents and um, maybe a spouse who's had an accident or was in the military and was injured. Or, you know, there's so many ways that people can end up in this working at home for no pay and no appreciation and no social security and no, I mean, it takes you out of a lot of the safety net even. Yeah. yeah so what do we I, do? What do we do, Michelle? How do we <laughs> Well, I think, I, yeah, there's, I think being active in, um, in our, uh, democracy is a huge part of it. And I think, um, and I, I call myself a, a conscious capitalist because I'm my, my, my piece of it, I think I got from like a movie when I was in, a teenager, like that SL, SLC punk where like, you have to change the system from inside. So like, we, we have a capitalist economy, like whether you agree with it or not, like it is what it is. And, um, and I believe that if we put our money towards the things that we believe in that, that like where we, whether we patronize companies that have value that, that like have flexible work schedules for their employees. And I mean, and there's so many companies, there's so many businesses, like you can't know the intricacies of like, and, and of every single business. And I'm sure every business, like there, you can find some flaw with something that they did or some, you know, but um, I do think that like, when we are more conscious of the way we spend our money and the, and not just like with the lattes, but like, you know, the, the whole, the lifestyle of it, of like, not just buying things because they feel good or, or, or we, of a, you know, because we think we should have them or, um, but like doing, 
investing in things that are good for your community or that are good for your environment or are good for, um, you know, your, your children or, or school, like, you know, education and, and, and those kind of things. And um, I don't know, I just don't think that we are totally powerless. I do think that like, like, I, like, I think that um, we can make change with our wallets that like, and I mean, like they're like, you look at like Walmart and, and Amazon right now, like everything is so cheap there that it's really hard to like get yourself to, to buy something that at a higher price point, that's something that's more sustainable or, um, you know, more in line with your own personal values, but it's not impossible. Like if, when you actually, um, I, I, what I've seen you know, working with clients and with myself is that we can make our dollars go a lot further than we think we can, you know, especially when we're, when we feel like we're living paycheck to paycheck and then, you know, things are really tight. Um, when we're more conscious of it and we do things from a place of like, how can I create the most good with my money and how can I create the most, like, how can I, you know, be the best citizen? And we are able to, um, you, you kind of like that same dollar can, can, can be stretched a little further than I think we initially think it can. Hmm. As you were talking about the political side of it, I can't help thinking of the fact that since the last election, I screen all my phone calls so carefully because I'm on lists from things that I've given to before. Like I get call, I feel like I get calls all the time. I mean, we're, we're only a year into this new presidency. Uh, and yet, as soon as the election was over, I felt like I got asked for more money than I did before. And I, there are reasons, and like I do, I give monthly to the ACLU because I feel like after looking at everything, I was like, I can't keep giving yeah. <laughs> based on my political ideals because I'm a single person. I have special needs kids. I don't have everything figured out the way I want for our ultimate future, which is um, when, when my daughter was diagnosed and we understood the extent of her special needs, the goalpost for my retirement moved from the end of my lifetime to the end of her lifetime, which is a big difference. You know, when you look at wanting to have a, uh, a principal amount of money that somebody can live off of for a long time. So with all of those things in mind, I am sick of being asked for money for political causes. Like, when I do answer, I'm just like donor fatigue. You, you can't keep asking us. Yeah. The individual person, we can't fund massive political movements all the time. I mean, there are moments when when we get swept up in stuff like the Million Woman March. That was amazing. I mean, there were things that moments when I'm like, yes, this is going somewhere. It keeps fizzling out and I can't keep giving. <laughs> and I think that it, it's not just a matter of like, you know, a lot of people say like, like, and that I think is a Dave Ramsey thing too, of like the 10% where you give to like, like 10% of your paycheck or, or your income goes towards you know, donating and yeah, causes. But I, don't, I don't think that that's like, you need to do that. I don't, I don't see that um, we need to give money towards something. And, and I don't just think that because like a lot of, you know, comp- uh, uh, nonprofits and, and charity organizations are corrupt. Cause you know, there's that argument also that like, where's your money actually going? And I don't think, I, I think that most places will spend your money well. Um, but. And for most of them, it's, you can find where they spend their money. I mean, if yeah. they're registered as a 501c3, you can go and look it up and you can yeah. see what's going on. And there are a lot of um, apps and stuff that help you with that now, right. like Greenhouse and Bicot. And, you know, you can, yeah. you can learn more about companies than you ever could before. Yeah. But, but I don't think that it's just like, like doing the, going to the March. Like I think like, like that might've cost money, like the in transportation costs or, you know, if you had to stay overnight or, or whatever. But yeah, I think, but there are local rallies too. Like, you know, there, and I don't think that you need to, I don't believe in just throwing money at, at these problems. Like I, I think that, you know, you can just, if you, if you like, like with the environment, like, like if you, if you believe in, you know, uh, trying to prevent climate change, you know, that are as drastic as climate change is going to be like you, you don't have to just, you know, pay money towards an organization or, or buy um, expensive, you know, recycled water bottles or whatever like you can just cut back on your waste or you can cut back on how much like processed food you get or or um you know just there's little lifestyle changes that you can make or you know turning lights off on your room which like the environment thing i think is also budget friendly because 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it saves you, it also saves you money to, you know, use less energy and to, you know, drive your car, you know, less distance. And um, so I, I think there's, there are like our, like kind of the whole time is money thing where, you know, how you spend your time is also um, a way of contributing to the causes you believe in and, and the causes you're fighting for that, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you pay for. It could be something that you do with your time. And, and, you know, we're all very busy, you know, so it's a lot easier to just like give money to an organization and be like, you, you deal with this because my life is busy, but, but we, I think, you know, we, we have a lot more time than we think, you know, when you look at how much time you spend on, you know, scrolling on Facebook or, you know, watching TV and, you know, I think that a lot of these activities are even things that you can like, you know, kill two birds with one stone type of thing where like you take your kids out, you know, like you can, it could be like an outing for like the family to go to a protest or, um, or it could be, you know, a bike, you know, going for a bicycle ride with your family instead of like taking the, the car, like, you know, those kind of things where you can kind of spin it in a way that, you know, has two benefits of like, your ideals and your budget. Mm -hmm. Michelle, could I pause for just a moment? The dog opened the door and I can hear my husband playing music upstairs. Sure. Let's go shut it real quick. Okay. I don't want to that out. <laughs> okay, it's definitely shut now. Okay. Um, all right. So within the realm of the holistic wallet, what kind of things do you help people with? I do mostly um, money, like I, I do money coaching with a focus on money psychology. So, or not just money psychology, but psychology in general to kind of use these um, mind hacks, if you will, uh, to incorporate good financial habits. And I think the, over the past year or two, I've been doing a lot of research on the psychology of habits. And because once you, like, if you're able to, you know, master your money habits, you can do it in a way that also masters your health habits or your relationship habits and, and that kind of stuff where it's really just a matter of um, finding a way to manipulate a craving that is better for your finances or that, you know, that, that still makes you feel good. You still feel like you're satisfying something that you're um, desiring. Mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't hurt you. Mm -hmm. So like the crunchiness you want from the potato chips, do a carrot stick instead, something like that, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. Did you read The Power of Habit? Yes. I, mean, I, was, I assumed when you said you were yeah. into habits. Yeah, I found that <laughs> book really it, yeah. fascinating too. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what like, you know, like I, I you know, said about my, how I went from a, a shopaholic to a personal finance addict. It was that, I was satisfying a craving, you know, like, like when I was, like, I've thought like, Oh, look, I've just mustered up the willpower that I'm able to manage my money so much better. And I'm able to pay off all, I'm able to commit to paying off all this debt and stashing all this money in savings and living below my means. And, and I was proud of that. And I was like, if I can do it, anyone else can do it. But I didn't see at the time that like, it was actually, I was satisfying a craving that like there, I wanted to feel like, I liked the way it felt to see my net worth increase, or I liked the way it felt to not have to make so many bill payments every month. And I, I liked the way it felt to play in a spreadsheet. I like spreadsheets. Like, like some people don't like spreadsheets. I can't, you can't force someone to do something that they, you know, it's just not something that they enjoy. And I think it's, it's, you know, finding those, finding, I help my clients find ways to, incorporate personal finance into their, you know, good money management skills into their life in a way that they get to do things that they actually enjoy doing. So when you started replacing old habits with these new habits and these new like victories of seeing the net worth go up and the bills drop away as you paid off debt, was that satisfying what before had been satisfied by buying something new and feeling the joy of ownership or how did that work? Yeah. So I think when I look deeper into it, it, it was, I accumulated a lot of stuff. Like I would go shopping a lot and whenever, like I did a lot of emotional spending. Um, 
And it, it wasn't so much that like, I liked having stuff. It was that I liked the feeling of being able to have that stuff. So it was like, it, it was like that, the feeling of not having to say no to myself. And, um, and it, it kind of, it, it's like a, a like a, the opposite of like a poverty mindset of like, look at all, you know, like, look at what I'm able to, to do with like, look at how much I have. It made me feel wealthier and more, I wouldn't say financially free, but like financially able. And, um, and I was still able to feel that way without buying things where I was able to, to feel that way by saving money. So it, I still was pursuing the same feeling of like a feeling like, I had like I was financially stable or financially secure or um, that I that I wasn't in need you know that I wasn't you know in, in bad financial condition even though you know just putting things on a credit card that is not the definition of you know a, a healthy um, you know finance you know that's that's not that's not wealth you know having mm -hmm. stuff with a credit card balance is not wealth it's you know you're, you're that doesn't increase your net worth at all. But, um, but in the moment, like sugar daddying yourself, being like, oh, go on, get those shoes. You've been a good girl. You know, yeah. That, and, and you know, I think the ability to buy something in the moment impulsively when you want it feels like power. Yeah. And I think it ends there, though. And that's yeah. kind of like what I would like. I, so you get the bill. <laughs> I hated myself when I was like, like I hated the feeling of getting home and having to find a place to put new stuff. And I didn't like the feeling of like having to look at my bank account balance or having to look at my credit card, like and seeing like, not just like what damage I had done there, but like, I didn't have anything to show for it. Like, yes, I had these like cool shoes, but like the, the novelty wore off. Like it, it just, and it takes a while to like really believe, like you just keep, like, oh, th well, this pair of shoes just wasn't good enough. Like, let me, th the next one will be the one that like really, you know, that'll seal the deal. Like I'll feel good about my, my life with that pair of shoes. And, and you keep or you, or people in my, like, like I, I did, we just keep pursuing that. Like, oh no, th this one just wasn't good enough. Like we'll get the next purchase is going to be the one that'll, that'll be enough. Like will be enough for, for that one. And, and then after a while, I'm like, I have enough data that this isn't actually working and, and what am I really, you know, after here? And, and it wasn't the stuff. It was the feeling of the stuff. And that feeling ends the second you like pay for it. Like once you, once you get it and it's yours and now you're the owner of that, you know, item, the, it, it, that feeling doesn't last. It's you're mm -hmm. on to the next one. Especially when you start decluttering your house and it goes out on the curb yeah. or to Goodwill or on yeah. eBay for yeah. like a fraction of what you paid for it. Yeah. 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 Stuff's a problem. Yeah. Stuff. Um, I've, I've downsized a lot and it's hard to do that, especially like when, like when you see how much you've spent on all that stuff and you're like, Oh my God, like I've just wasted so much money and it, and I just kind of, the way that I was able to make peace with it was just like, I am who I am today because of that. Like I learned that that wasn't, that wasn't what I was actually looking for. And I, I, my, I made, I think I made mistakes with a lot of those purchases, but I learned from those mistakes. So as I threw a lot of stuff out or I donated a lot of stuff and I was like, oh my God, this is so much money that I'm just like, throwing away, but I had already thrown it away. Like I had, I wasn't using this stuff anyway. So mm -hmm. money was already gone. I, you know, keeping, you know, keeping it in my house wasn't, if someone else could have it, you know, or then maybe, you know, it had a better use than, you know, just being there, but it was, it's hard to, you know, to kind of, especially, you know, downsizing with anything to, to, to feel like you've wasted money is just a, a horrible feeling, you know, especially when you're, you know, work so hard to, to kind of get ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things I liked about um, the Cone Marie book. Did you read the life-changing magic of tidying up? Yeah, I did that. This idea of taking each thing, you know, and like seeing if it really still now brings you joy. And if it doesn't like thanking it, being like, yeah, 
thanking it for what it's done for you and then passing it on to the next donor or whatever's going to happen to yeah. it made that feel but and then also like feeling the joy of things actually leaving yeah it was like oh yeah this actually feels really good to have like five trash bags leave my yeah. house right now. yeah it, it is it is a great feeling I, I i was watching an episode of malcolm in the middle um and the, the family they're throwing things into a chipper shredder and uh and i'm like oh my god like i wish i could have done that like to not see any like to just like pulverize everything but, hmm. but then nobody gets used out of it but it just like that feeling of like it's gone like yeah but i bet that would be really good with breakups yes just like shred polarize it yeah <laughs> Because then you don't actually want the thing around anymore. But yeah. yeah. So if someone is listening to this and is cringing because they're like, that's me. I go and buy things when I'm not feeling good and it makes me feel better and more powerful and like I have more control over my life. And then I get home and I'm sad because yeah. I feel like that, I feel like it immediately is no longer worth what I already paid for it. What, can you give some tips to get someone started? Like how, how did you start on your path to turning the shopaholism around paying off the debt and in enjoying the accumulation of money instead of stuff. Well, I think you know, it's, it's really hard to change a habit. Like, and even, even when we like figure out the psychology of it and like, and knowing like, Oh, you need a different, you need, you need to find a different way to satisfy the same craving. Um, it still is, it's, there's a lot, there's a, like the, the whole progress isn't linear thing. Like there's, there's going to be setbacks. Like it's, it's never going to be perfect. You're never going to just like flip and be a different person, you know, do, you know, change your strategy altogether the next day. Um, what worked for me was having like a cheat sheet almost of like not having to think like, you know, kind of like streamlining the whole pro like decision-making process of like, okay, like, I don't feel good. What can I do instead? Or like, like, or not instead, just like, I don't feel good. What can I do? And not having shopping on that list of like being like, oh, I can, you know, I'm not a runner, but go for a jog. Like some people like exercise, like cardio makes, you know, you have the whole endorphin thing, like that makes you feel good. Or even like having a bowl of ice cream, like, like that doesn't have to be something that, or even if you, even if like, you're like shopping is my thing. Like I feel great when I go shopping, go shopping for one item. And, and it feels good. It, when you not only stick to that, like you, so you, you get, you feel the craving of like accumulating something, but you don't have like all that remorse because your goal was one item, like to, of sticking to one item and you were able to do that. And you have that like positive reinforcement of like, oh, look, I, I can control my spending, like, and, or I, I can control my impulses and stuff. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think that also makes you value that one item a lot more because not only is it just like, oh, I got this because my boss was mean to me today, but like, I got this. And it also symbolizes that, like, I was able to only get this thing. Like I was, I didn't get like my, my shopping, um, therapy is home goods like I just love like all the the plates and the bowls and and I have all these like mismatched cups and I have like my cup collection is a, like a symbol of me being like I want something nice to show for like my crappy day and I have like this cup is for that and it's like most of the, I haven't spent more than like six dollars on a cup but it's something that I have like I satisfied that craving, but I also did it in a way that like, didn't make me also feel bad about myself. Mm -hmm. And it didn't turn into the like, I'm going into Target for one item and I'm coming out with $200 worth of stuff that I didn't plan on buying. Right. Yeah. Okay. So finding, okay, make a list of what you can do when you feel crappy that either doesn't include shopping or is getting a single item. What else? Well, I think boundaries is another big thing. Like, you know, we, as kids, we don't want boundaries, right? Like our parents, like, you know, either they set curfews or we don't have our own money to spend and there's, and so then we, we, we are adults and we have disposable income or, or our own income that we have autonomy over and In we're like, cards. yeah, <laughs> and we just, we're like, we have total say over this and 
we have complete freedom and it's awesome. Right. But, um, we actually don't like the, the reason that we keep, um, spending or we keep, you know, we keep like pushing the envelope almost because we're looking for that boundary. We're still looking for that limit. And, um, mm. and you, you see like, and I, I look back and like, you know, my child, like I had, I had a childhood full of, there were, there were not many limits in, in, you know, not that like my parents were, were wealthy or anything, but um, I just was able to do whatever I wanted to do. And I always, I still craved some kind of boundary. Like I, I you, you kind of like, you want to hit the ground when you fall. Like you don't want to keep having safety nets thrown out from under you, thrown under you. Um, I mean, we, we don't, no one, none of us will admit to that. We don't actually, but we, we just, you, otherwise without those boundaries, it feels like, what are we all doing it for? Like, what's the purpose of this? Like, um, you, like we need some kind of structure in our lives. We need, and it, cause, because that will help define, you know, our purpose. So like, so when you're, you know, spending, um, you know, money without some kind of structure, like a budget or, um, a spending plan or, or um, you know, it's kind of like, well, what am I doing? And, and, and it, that's kind of where we feel crappy about our, our money because we're like, what do I have to, sh like, I work so hard. What do I have to show for it? And, um, and because, you know, when you work, you get money and, and that's, you know, that, the, that, you know, micro economy of um, our personal income. We, we want that to, to look like, you know, what, like whether you're, you have a job that you're like super passionate about you're like oh, i'm changing the world and like my money is whatever but like if you for many of us that you know our job isn't our passion like it's just a matter of um you know paying our rent and and our you know and for food and and it's you know to do other things outside of work you want that stress from work and all that to, to uh feel good and i think you know having some kind of structure around that is like a, a safety kind of feeling of, of like, of knowing where you end up kind of. So what does that look like? Like what's the practical application of that? If I'm, I'm making bulleted tips here in our show. Notes. So okay. what, is, what is this action that someone can take? Well, I think, you know, a budget is, is, um, like I don't see budgets as like a restriction on spending. I see it as like a plan for spending. So like you're, you're like, we are going to spend money and there's nothing wrong with spending money. Um, it's ideal to spend money on the things that you want to spend money on that, that go towards fulfilling whatever goals you have, whether it's a, a strictly financial thing of paying down debt, or if it's something like, I want to save the planet with my money and, um, you know, putting your money towards, you know, like kind of where your heart is. And, um, so like, so like, it's kind of like that, that abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset of like, like, look at this money I have, how can I create more of what I like with it versus like the scarcity of like, um, I keep losing money. Like all my, my money is going like, you know, I, I, I earn money and now it's gone. Like, and I spent it and I have nothing to show for it. Not seeing like all the things that you do have to show for your money. Like you have a roof over your head and you have food in your fridge and, and you have shoes on your feet. Like, like all these things that like we, we kind of, we're always looking at for the next thing. We don't see like all the things that we already have. And, um, and when you, you know, are tr like when you have a budget, you're tracking that you're, 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 it's not so much of like that you have, like we're paying attention to it to be, conscious of it not as like a punishment to ourselves or like you know that, that you know we were bad with our money and now we have to you know pay the price and now we have to budget and it's a it's whole bad you know negative thing it's just a way of uh, it's like a, a tool almost to to, to uh, create this habit of consciously interacting with our money and uh, and watching the things that our money brings in for us and whether it, you know that's mm -hmm. the necessities or the the non-necessity is the wants. Do you have favorite um, apps or programs that you like to work with with people for budgeting um, or structuring? Yeah. 
I, I don't like apps. Um, I have like a love hate relationship with apps. My thing with like, I don't like things like mint or, um, learn vest and because, um, like that where they automatically pull your credit card expenses or your debit card expenses. Um, I think it's great to like track the data if, you know, if you're, if you're not good at like plugging things in, but you're, you're still like you swipe the card and there's still like a three day lag between when that actually gets uploaded to the, to the app. And um, I mean, that's might've gotten a little better with like pending expenses, but mm-hmm. um but I, I, I feel just, like my mint ones show up pretty immediately. Yeah. But, um, see, so I like it because I feel like without those, I, I don't always yeah. remember. Yeah. Enter everything in. Yeah. But it's uh, a new habit to create of like, um, whether like I, I like to like more physically interact with it. So like there were apps like Wineab or, um, and I think you could even do it with like with Mint or Learn Invest where you treat things as cash and you plug in the expense like so you you pay and you have your smartphone and you you know type it in and you see you know right then like what's what balance do I have left in my grocery budget now or what balance do I have left in my you know entertainment budget and and seeing that you know um without you know waiting till the next time you open the app of getting into the habit of, of seeing it up front and how much you have left at any point in time. Okay. Yeah. I, I just opened mine and was scrolling through it for a time. And I'm like, huh. Um, so if someone's not into apps, straight up spreadsheet? Um, spreadsheets are good. Um, or the whole like envelope method of like, um, you know, setting the cash aside and spending that cash until it's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, where you don't have to do any math. You just kind of have to count, you know, you just keep track of the money that you have on hand. Um, and, and my thing with budgets is like, it's very um, general. Like I keep budget categories big, like, or at least the, the variable spending budgets. I, so like if you spend too much in groceries, you can pull, you can pull from your entertainment budget or, um, you know, not having like all these nitty, you know, tiny, um, categories that's like oh my god like I'm three dollars over this budget like what am I going to do now where like you have a bigger amount of cash that you can kind of choose where it's going and um you don't have to worry about going over or under the main thing is that like you're you don't spend more than your monthly budget you know that that you have like a bigger pool of money that like you can outweigh one with the other and, and kind of you know even that out um mm-hmm. I, I, I still I have a hard time spending with cash um I like I just don't like change I still don't understand why pennies are in circulation but um when you but, can't buy anything with a penny anymore I mean, like what <laughs> it's just such a waste but um and I, I like there was um I forget what which acorns I think it was where they like um, round up, round up and, and put that into savings and I tried that too and I don't know. It, it, I, we're all different. It's, it's like a lot of it's going to be trial and error of like f- trying something like being brave enough to, to pick something, try it. And if you're like, this sucks, like it's not that you aren't good at it. It's that you didn't find the right system yet. And you have to, you know, try another app or try another use pen and paper or use cash or, you know, it's, there's a whole bunch of things we could keep trying. It, we're all you know going to have our own uh, magic slipper or whatever the, the analogy is I, I totally thought so when people come to work with you do you mainly do one-on-one or do you do groups or do you have a program how do you um, I have a course um and most of my clients kind of come from that course or um I do mostly one-on-one or couples um apps with couples is fun I actually found a good app for couples that um the name escapes me. I, and I just deleted it from my, I, I just made a, I, I did a magic art of tidying my cell phone apps last night. So, <laughs> and that didn't make the cut um, because I'm single. So, um, so yeah, so I work mostly like one-on-one and, and like, and, and what I will come up, I'll create a plan for, for my clients um, where, you know, it has the whole debt repayment piece and the savings piece and the budget and, and um, 
kind of how to set everything up, like like the whole like um, a uh, flow chart of where the money's coming from and how it goes, and more of like a visual um, right brain um, portrayal of finances, not just like money like uh, numbers on on a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. But I always say like when I deliver those plans, like it's it's always a final draft. Like it's, it's never, you're never going to have that like final copy that like, this is perfect. And this isn't changing. Like it, our, our financial lives are always changing. Like there's always going to be some variable expense that comes up that like, whether we anticipated it or not, like there's just so much variation in our finances and our, and our lives in general, not just like, you know, our, our jobs, our salaries can change with, you know, not just in, in, like they, our salaries can go up, you know, it's not just like, bad things happen but like things like you can in inherit some money or you could you know there's 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 always going to be these fluctuations um and um or and technologies change you know like and so i create systems that like are i always i like to say like our financial lives are always going to be a work in progress like there is no perfect like uh like nirvana of um money management like there's still going to be hiccups and there's going to be like you know you're still going to second guess like did I pay that bill and, and there's always going to be like as new things come into our lives and we adapt to them there's there's always going to be change um so yeah so I I, I always like to say like to embrace that that whole um that experience of it like and, and for your, your listeners too like when things don't work out like keep doing it like you know keep trying different things and and keep you know because you never know like you know when you're going to stumble on the thing next that um you know that that that's what works like you know all these little failures are lessons and i think that you know uh you know i don't have the magic ticket of like what's going to work like i don't have like this magic system of like here like this is what i do for myself or this is what i do for my other clients and this works because i don't think i've ever had um two clients that were like exactly <laughs> yeah, like they, that that had that were like oh this system works best like these systems i create are it's i'm always starting at you know kind of square one with everyone and kind of you know whether if they're predominantly cash spender or a credit card spender and every, you know everyone's kind of different so is that the first step to usually do is kind of find out where they are right now and then you tailor the system to them yeah um, some people like want something drastic. Some people are like, I can't stop spending with my credit card. I want to spend with cash. And they like the accountability of like, like, you know, they're not just doing it on their own. They have someone else, you know, that, that some other party, you know, watching, so to speak that, um, that they're like, oh, I have to spend with cash. Cause you know, and, and um, you anyway, know, investing in a money coach where you're like, you, you put money towards this to, to, you know, improve your financial life. Like you're going to put in the work because, you know, you, you, it's another thing you put your, you know, you, you spent money on that. Like you want something to show for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always an interesting dilemma. I think with investing in a money coach is usually the time when you're investing in the money coach is when you, your money situation has gotten to the point where you're like, I can't handle this on my own. I need some help from someone else, but then that costs money as well. Yeah. What kind of price point is your program and your one-on-one -on -one services at? Um, I think, it depends on how long the the plan itself is about three fifty, um, where it's just me. You, know, you give me the your your numbers and your mindset and stuff, and I come up with a plan that's you know both budget and like the financial plan and also the psychological plan. Um, and then there's you know the coaching after that 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 varies. That you know I can um, those packages can go up to like about two thousand for the year. Um, about each session is about 150 okay um and the course what the is the course, course the course is about uh there's always a sale on that so that's runs usually like 250 um and then just the book for that is 27 to 50 depending okay. on that. so i don't know i always ask people prices on things but i feel like when we're focusing on money yeah we just put numbers out there and, and figure yeah. out what it is so the idea then is they make this upfront investment in working with you, but by changing their habits through the course of this, I assume that they will get back on track 
more than what they've invested over time. Right. So that's the thing, like it, and it, like, I can't ever quantify that for anyone because I don't know what their lives are going to be like in the future. And, and, and you know, it, what they get out of working with me is also what they put into it. It's not just like I create something and they're like, Oh, thanks. And they like, you have to actually do the work. You have to make the changes. You have to pay attention to your money. Like there's, you're still the, you know, my client is the one that's doing the, the most of the work, you know? Um, but like you look at like how much we pay and that's kind of something I like to illustrate in the plans that I um, draw up are like how much interest they're paying and how much um, interest they could earn on certain amounts of you know, money and savings and, and that kind of stuff and, and what that could afford down the road. Um, mm-hmm. And even just like, even not just like the cost and benefit of, of interest, but um when you spend mindfully and, and you can kind of pick up extra money in your monthly budget of like, like whether it's, you know, instead of using the Uber so, so often, you know, uh, taking public transportation instead or, or walking or, or, um, you know, carpooling and, um, and seeing like, Oh, like, look, there's that $200. Like, so the, the budget that people have when they first start working with me, is not the budget that they have when they start, you know, paying attention to their finances and, and they're, when they're spending more consciously. Um, that what they think they can afford is um, a lot less than what they actually can afford when they, you know, Wait. paying attention to what they. So like like when you when they're not watching where their money's going, where they're just like like when they just at the end of the month they're like oh my god like I'm just so broke but they don't see that like how much money that are, is going towards things that they didn't actually have to spend money on. They didn't actually want to spend money on that. They're like, well, I, I needed these clothes or I need like, they, they're like, Oh, I only spent $20 here at target or I only spent $30 there at, at, at Walgreens or all those little purchases that like weren't actually necessary mm-hmm. and, and how those actually add up to a much bigger number that like if, they were tracked more closely and, and spaced out um, more efficiently um, for things that you actually needed or actually, you know, that not just needed, but wanted um, that you couldn't actually wait for. Um, that opens up a lot of space in people's budgets. Like, and I see like, like the, the most notorious category I think is our groceries. Like, like everyone overspends on groceries where you kind of like go and, and, and no one really knows how, like how much they spend. Like you and I, we know how much we spend every month on groceries, but most people when they first start working with me, like they have no idea what, like what, and they don't think that they're spending that much, like oh, a hundred dollars here, fifty dollars there. Like they don't really see it until they add it all up. And they're like, oh my God, like I spend $1,300 a month on groceries. Like my rent's not that high. Like, and then, and then they're like, oh, how do you, how is that even pot? Like they don't even realize like how that could be until they start like making meal plans and, and like trying to use up what they have in the pantry already. And, and like, Oh, like I've seen, I had a client reduce her um, grocery budget from, it was like averaging out to like 1500. She got it down to $600. Like it's impressive. It's from like, not, and not like that she was like eating like beans and rice you know, every night. Like she, it was just like, what like not just getting things because they were on sale and not just getting things because she's like oh i'm in the mood for i think i'll be in the mood for that later and like then wasn't and threw out a lot of like produce that she never you know or, or was too busy to cook a lot of the produce that she you know thought she was going to and and there's the cost of working with me you know like that right you know right there so mm-hmm. okay well that's really interesting thank you for sharing all of those tips and um ideas with us Thank you for giving me the place to do that. Sure. Um, and I was, I was in my mind, I was trying to tally out some bullet pointed tips. I think we can get them out of what we talked about. <laughs> I always think that helps with the, you know, having the, uh, the show notes and everything. Um, is there any last thing that you want to share before we go? Um, I just think I have a, um, a little ebook that a seven step uh, money cleanse where um, it just seven simple steps. You can spend it out over seven days or do everything one day. 
um, that you can pick up. It's called The Money Cleanse at moneycleanse.holisticwallet.com. And you can, it's kind of like a magic art of tidying your finances, but. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Makes it sound like a juice cleanse or something. Yeah. Yeah. I try to like do that, but like in a more sustainable way that it's not just like, you know, drinking juice for four days and then going back to potato chips on day five. Like, you know, like doing it in a way that like it's actually sustainable and you kind of set yourself up to keep, to stick with it once the cleanse is over and it's back to your normal life. Okay. Well, that sounds great. We'll share the link for that in the show notes. Awesome. All right. And I will see you around the internet then. Yes. Bye. Bye